you certainly couldn't tell anybody what we were going to do because we weren't told. We had no idea what the target was going to be. And it was kept that way right up until the briefing day. Had it. We operated in the blind. I suppose if we thought about it, operating against the, uh, the uh, reservoirs should have, have given us a clue. But then we were too stupid and young and stupid to think about things like that. <coughs> and we're too happy with our low flying. So we moved from day flying into simulated night where the front perspex of the aircraft was covered in blue sheeting and the nose as well. The pilot and the bar member wore night vision glasses and it created a very good twilight situation. And it was on one of those North Sea trips that I spotted the dinghy in the water. Two people in it, waving like mad as we went over. So Joe told the watch operator to signal base, our position, and the sighting of this dinghy. Fine. We had then came back, and about three days later, had a signal from the CO of a, a boat fighter squadron thanking us for reporting that dinghy. The two had had the ditch, and they were picked up by the sea launch in double quick time and brought back to safety. So that was something useful done as well as flying over the North Sea. <coughs> <coughs> and then of course, once night flying problem, and that was what it was, the same sort of exercises all the time, but this was the night. And it had to be obviously in right of mind. A bit difficult to map read in the dark. But there we go. By the end of six weeks training or thereabouts, Gibson decided that we were ready to go. It actually didn't depend entirely on him. But until I tell you what the targets were, I can't tell you what, what, why it wasn't entirely his service. So, on the, the evening of the 15th, we met Barnes Wallace as a squadron, probably for the first time we'd all met him. And he explained to us, through um, uh, film, how he developed the bouncing bomb. We'd seen this arrive on the, on the station. It was just like a glorified dustbin, a big glorified dustbin. But it became obvious what those legs are for. They obviously were going to support it and be the way that it's going to be carried. Bart's wife told us at that stage something more about the bomb. It weighed 9,000 pounds, of which 6,500 was explosive. And that was fused with two depth charges, two depth fuses, which are set to expose load at a depth of 25 feet. But it was also fixed with a self-destruct fuse. So if we had to drop it away from the dams, it would explode when it landed and the Germans wouldn't have a copy. So that was a story. And that, of course, raised conjecture because the bomb had to be dropped some 425 yards away from the target. It had to be rotated backwards at 500 breaths a minute. It had to be dropped from exactly 60 feet at a ground speed of 200 knots. The 60 feet was developed by the, the specialists of Farmer, where they fitted <coughs> they fitted two oldest lamps to start the fuse launch, both angled to converge at exactly 60 feet. And so the, uh, the practice of uh, operation, obviously, the way of operation, the bomb was switched on, the rotation was switched on shortly after takeoff. 
before that, the navigator would be watching the lights, and he'd be saying, up or down, the flight engineer was watching the speed, and the bombing man was directing the, the uh, pilot to the target through his box height. So it became a, a three crew, at least four crew operation. It meant the pilots were being told by three members of the other members of the crew how to fly the airplane. They didn't complain, they just followed with it. So that, that was the setup. On the following day, Sunday, we're all called on the tower to report to the operations room, to the briefing. And then we saw what the target was. After the previous evening's explanation, we conjectured that it would probably be the German battleships, notably the Turkish, since we've been dropping them off that sort of distance away, we'd be able to get away before the effective uh, 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 aircraft guns on open up on us from the gun. How wrong can you be? In the briefing room, there is a model of the Moe Dam, a model of the Zorba Dam, the model of the Ada had been completed. The large map up on the wall, which showed two groups in and one route out. What a great briefing that was to the AOC was there, the station commander, when Commander Gibson, of course, was doing the briefing. Barnes Wallace was there to manage clients. The station chief commander's officer and engineering officers were there, and the dear old men man was there to give us his briefing. He was rather fortunate that, that most men met man in that the object of the, the, the flight was it should be in bright moonlight. So he could tell us in all confidence what the time the weather was going to be like when we got out of the target and when we got back. And for once he was quite right. So Gibson did the briefing. He would take off with two other aircraft and they would head for the moment down. They'd be followed by six others in two threes, again heading for the moment. And if when they got there, the moment had been breached, they'd have joined in the attack on that under Gibson's control. And once the moment was breached, they would move over to the sort to the uh, any shut up to the end. Sorry about the shut up, I do that pre frequently myself. <laughs> <laughs> they go up to the end and attack that. That counts nine troops. Five of which we won were briefed for the Zorba. And of course, the Zorba had to be different. It had no towers for sighting, and it was so placed in the hills that the head on the side was extremely if difficult, if not impossible. And so we were briefed <coughs> that we had to fly down one side of the hills with a port house engine over the dam itself, and fly along the, the dam and estimate <coughs> strongly in the centre. weren't spinning the bomb at all, it was going to be an inert drop. So the conditions for the dropping of that bomb didn't, didn't apply. It wasn't a particularly easy exercise to get into. We hadn't practiced that type of thing at all. And so it was the first come, first served. If I wasn't satisfied, I called W up. If Joe wasn't satisfied, he just pulled away and left me to call the W-Rap. 
true humorist was the rear gunner, Dave Roger. And after about the sixth or seventh of these dummy runs, a voice from the inside, well, somebody to that bomb out of here. And I had to realize how to cover the most popular end of crew in double quick time. <laughs> Neither Joe nor I said anything to each other about it. But I'm sure we both realized that the lower we got, the less forward travel that bomb would have before it hit the water. And similarly, the lower we got, the easier it would be to estimate the dropping point. There's no sighting, if you like, by guess by God. So, on the 10th run, we were down to 30 feet. And when I said, bomb gone, that Christ came from the rear <laughs> We had, of course, to be nose up straight away to avoid the hills on the other side. So I didn't see the explosion. But Dave did in the rear turret. And he reckoned that the shaft of water went up to about a thousand feet. But if you can imagine 6,500 pounds of explosive being detonated in a depth of 25 feet of water, it's going to move a hell of a lot of water in all directions. However, we circled and we saw that we just crumbled the top of the dam for a distance of about 10 yards. Now, Barnes Wallace had told us before we left, he estimated it would take six bombs to crack that dog because of its structure. Totally different, different structure from the, the, the other two. I think they were called gravity dams. This one was built like a pyramid rock, soil, on either side, packed down on it. A centre of the concrete core and concrete on the outside. Hence, is my experience. We thought it would take at least six, six bombs to crack it. He said, if you can crack it, the water pressure will do the rest. And judging from the amount of water in that dam, I'm sure he was right. What we couldn't understand. Five crews had been briefed, and for other reasons, we were late taking off. But by the time we got there, none of the others were there, and no one appeared to have been there, and that arrived from us through there. And we didn't find that out until we got back. However, we said, Caught you for home. And then I think, first, the most rewarding part of the whole trip, from my point of view, was that the route took us over what had been the moan, which you knew by radio had already been reached. It was just like an inland sea. There was water everywhere, and we're still coming out of that dam, 20 minutes, perhaps half an hour later. And we knew again by radio that the Ada had been breached as well. But we had the satisfaction of seeing the success of some of the operation that particular night. And it was certainly, from my point of view, very rewarding. So we took an offer there, or at least towards here. For some unknown reason, I, I wasn't watching too carefully. And I'm getting them up reading right. But we need to get off track. And we found ourselves over first a railway and then a Martian yard. As it happened, it was the Martian yard of Ham, which was the delivery point for all the armors that were made in the room to the various war centres. Not the healthiest places to be in the early evenings of May. Once again, down goes Joe. And again, to a rear turret. Who needs guns? At this height, 
All they need to do is change the points. <laughs> so, we eventually got back. I hadn't mentioned. Wasn't quite a way out. Because the, we had no bunker made up of turret, the front gunner was riding in the front turret. Fortunately, the steering system did so he wasn't kicking me up the backside all the time. But um, as we were going out, flying south of that, there was a good stream travelling along the right of this route track. And Joe, and it's wrong, said to Joe, Can I have a go, Joe? And I think someone will look at me. Joe said, Oh, yeah, all right. Rob opened up with these little 303s, which is all we had in the front turret at the good stream. What we didn't know, of course, it wasn't just a good stream, it was an armoured good stream, and it replied rather more than 303s. <laughs> we knew it'd been hit, we heard it, and we felt it. Um, but it didn't impede the aircraft, so we pressed on. We didn't find out about the history of that until we got back either. But we did get back eventually. And scattered at that stage was still across the airfield. So all the landings were a little bit more lumpy than usual. But I was rather lumpy lumpy. And we were starving low. Flight engineer looking out the first leg said, we've got a burst tire skipper. So we taxi to disperse. And the inspection team took the aircraft off. And when the chief came back, he thought this, forgetting his aircraft shot up to start with. But he could explain the, the shot we had heard and felt had passed through the starboard undercarriage and cell, burst the tyre en route, and then passed it through the wing and landed in the roof just above the navigator's head. How lucky can you get? We got away with it on that occasion. Then we began to decide why nobody else was there. Let's not row and then the New Zealand pilot I've been so badly shot up going over the Dutch coast that not only had the aircraft been damaged, but his communication system, internal and external, was completely not abolished. And since it was a communications operation, there was no point in him going on. So he came back. Jeff, Jeff Lawrence. Was flying there over the side of the sea. And he suddenly, sorry, subsequently admitted he was foolish enough not to wash his, his ultimatum. And he got so low that he got the bomb in the water, it ripped off the aircraft, and the aircraft flew over the top of it, which didn't do the aircraft any good at all, apart from damaged the fuselage. It knocked off the tail wheel. But it also knocked over the ELSA inside the aircraft. And the contents of the ELSA flowed into the rear gunner's turret. He wasn't very happy about that either. But there we are. So that was that. <laughs>